Good morning. I'm Andrew. I'm the student pastor at Rockbrook, and it is an honor to be the student pastor. We have a great team of just people who care for the students, and they are amazing. Our student dream team lets dozens of college age and high school and junior high students into their homes and lets them eat their food and spill on their carpet. I appreciate them so much. Rockbrook, there are over 90 Dream Team ministries that are done by students over the weekend. Over 90 by students. Greeters, worship teams, small group leaders, children's workers, students making a difference in their church. I just want to say to our students, at Rockbrook, you are not a project to us. You are part of our church family. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You are awesome. I love this church. I showed some uh, old report cards, and uh, I don't have current ones, uh, old report cards and notes, I may have current ones, uh, sent home to my parents. And I just wanted to share, I shared those with my small group, and I wanted to share them with you. So let's start in kindergarten. Kindergarten, Andrew is doing fine in his schoolwork. Please encourage him not to talk to his friends during class and to settle down a bit at rest time. Next one, one month later, kindergarten. Andrew has been having trouble controlling himself the last few days. Please talk with him about not acting up in class, giggling, and distracting others. First grade. This is a rather small thing, but Andrew needs to remember not to scribble, draw on his paper. He knows this, but he forgets. He cannot be alone in the hall, restrooms, or anywhere with his friend Andy. It's too bad. They're such good friends. I sure enjoy his items for show and tell. He's very creative. He's doing very well. Second grade. Andrew is a sweet boy. He has so much energy that he sometimes needs to work on self-control. He's doing very well in cursive penmanship. That helped me. Fourth grade. Throughout the year, I've had to get on to Andrew for this or that. And I've always seen him give me a positive response. That is not a natural response, but rather one that has been nurtured. It is obvious that you have put many hours of training and counsel into Andrew, (laughs) as well as hours of processing. Andrew loves people. That is one characteristic that seems strongest and makes him beloved by all the students. Eighth grade. I appreciate Andrew's enthusiasm during class. At times, he needs to take his work more seriously. 11th grade, two words. <laughs> Distracting others. I love, I love this church. I grew up in church, and it wasn't like this. We had some grumpy people in church. And there are some people here who are the age of grumpy people. And sometimes we will play a rockin' song up here or beat on trash cans. And you come up to me after the service and go, that was awesome. That was so great. That was so much fun. And I realized we don't have grumpy people here. We have cheerleaders. So I love you. I love you. We do stuff here that we used to get in trouble for. <laughs> Running with the Giants is a series that we're looking at giants of the faith. And we're using this verse out of Hebrews as a backdrop for this series. And it starts with the word, therefore. It's a continuation of the previous chapter, chapter 11. And it's the hall of faith, of fame. It's a group of people who believed God, ordinary people who are inspiring. But you should not think, you should not just be inspired by them and think, that can't happen to me. No, no, no. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... That is a crazy thought. That they haven't just finished their race. They're watching you run your race. If you've ever wondered if people in heaven can see us on earth, that verse says yes. Your loved ones cheering you on, saying, come on, you can make it. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. I love this because the Bible admits it's hard. It's hard. The Bible isn't saying, hey, what's wrong with you? Come on, can't you get it together? No, it's saying it's hard. you got to throw some stuff off that hinders. And let us run with perseverance. Hang in there, baby. 
that race, the race marked out for us. In some ways, we are running with the giants. And this whole series has been an encouragement for you to win your race. Uh, And it's like if the saints could come down and give us a word right now. If they could come down and speak to us right now, what would they say? And it's encouragement because the Bible knows it's hard. This week, we're looking at Elisha. Elisha was with the great man, Elijah. Elijah was the mentor to Elisha. Elijah was great. He was so great that he never, he never died. He went straight to heaven in a chariot of fire. He is one of the two people who never really died a natural death. God just took them from the earth. Elijah is probably the greatest Old Testament prophet. He confronted evil. He was a mighty man who had 14 recorded miracles. He shows up in the New Testament, shows up with Jesus when Jesus was transfigured. That's the term for changing into a glorified body. Jesus' body was changed, and a few of the disciples saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. So Elijah is important because he meets with Jesus. And I think Elijah shows up in the book of Revelation. During the last days, the tribulation, two people are going to come from heaven. They're called the two witnesses. And it might be Moses and Elijah. It doesn't say their name, but it just some of the details suggest that it's them. All that to say, Elijah is an important guy. So why are we talking about Elisha rather than talking about Elijah? Well, it's because I think Elisha is someone that you can relate to better. Elisha ends up being great with a recorded 28 miracles, the exact double of his mentor. But Elisha's beginning wasn't great. Elisha spent most of his life wondering this question, would his life ever count? He spent most of his life wondering if his life would ever count. Most of his story is not greatness. Most of his story is a horrible word, waiting, waiting and nothing happening. Elisha spent most of his life being a farmer, steering oxen. He plowed the field with two oxen. Now imagine that's your job. Every day, eight, ten hours a day, your vantage point is the rear end of two oxen and the residue thereof. And watching them produce the residue thereof. And the smells. And some of you are thinking, ah, that's pretty close to what I'm doing now. Yeah. You know, some of you, this is your Monday morning. That's it. Some of you in school, this is what Monday smells like. For years and years, that's Elisha's view. And I think a word of encouragement that we would get from Elisha right now, he would say, I had no idea. I had no idea. Listen to this. That even though my life would start that way, I would end up seeing God do twice as many miracles in my life as the person I was admiring, the greatest person I had ever met, Elijah. There are so many of us. And, and that's how we see ourselves. I'm just a distraction. I want to give you some pastorly advice right now. Most of us don't see ourselves correctly. My life doesn't matter. It doesn't count. I just do the same thing year after year. My life doesn't change. That's my viewpoint. Ox rears and smells. And I want you to know, and Elisha wants you to know, that God has greatness for you. So how do I get from this vantage point to greatness with God? I want you to write this down. Give your best wherever God puts you. Wherever he puts you, give your best. Because when you're behind the behinds of oxen, when you're doing the work that seems tedious and smelly and no fun, are you ready for this? Listen to this. God is watching. God is watching. God is watching how you respond to it. He's watching how you handle it. He's watching what you do with it. And here's what Elisha would say now, cheering us on. You need to understand how God works. He is watching you before you become great to see if you have the potential to actually be great. He is watching. That's why wherever you are, at school, at home, at work, give your best to God because he is watching. Let me give you three areas where you give your best. You give your best in obscurity, and God will reward it. 
Obscurity means that you think you're not being noticed by anybody, even God. I don't think anybody even knows I'm here. I want you to look at this part of history. So Elijah went and found Elisha. This is when they first met, first met, and Elisha admires this guy, Elijah. Elisha was plowing a field. And it's interesting that Elisha is not a poor guy. Twelve teams of oxen. I mean, he probably comes from a wealthy family. And Elisha was plowing with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak over his shoulders. And in that culture, that's a sign of come to work with me. Elijah hired him. He took him on and then walked away. And for 10 years, nothing, nothing. Elisha knows he's called. 10 years. Some of you know you're called. Elisha had dreams. You have dreams. But you're wondering, why is it taking so long? Listen, listen, listen. Because God is watching. He's watching how you handle the obscure times. He's watching. I'm telling you, he is watching. On Monday nights, I have a a small group of of students that meet in my home. And uh, some junior high, some high school. Uh, Corey is a college-age guy that helps lead the small group. And he is a much better small group leader than I am. And a few weeks ago... Three junior high boys were over here and were wrestling over some food while I'm trying to do our small group lesson. So I just stop, and I'm watching them. We're just waiting. And, and Jake and Corey, Corey, they're, over, they're sitting over here. Jake is in high school, so Corey's in college, Jake's in high school, and both of them are, are good guys. They are committed to small group. They are committed to serving on dream teams here at church. They love Jesus, and they live like it. And they are staring at these screwballs over here uh, wrestling during the the lesson. And Jake says, how do you deal with this? And I said, you were just like that when you were in junior high. And he goes, I'm sorry. (laughs) I said, don't be. Don't be sorry. said, if these guys stick with Jesus and church and small group, these guys turn into you guys. Corey and Jake nod their head. These three guys sit up straight. They kind of pull their shoulders back. They're like, we're going to be good guys. All of a sudden, they're answering questions or participating in the lesson. They're like, we're going to be good guys. You know, it's just crazy. And I often have people come up and ask, how do you work with young people these days? I mean, it just seems the world is getting so much darker, so much more difficult. And I tell them, here's what I have seen. The students who have gotten plugged in to what is going on, they're in small group. They serve in the church on a dream team. They participate in the student trips. They are the ones who get jobs. They are the ones who get promoted. They are the ones who, when they ask for time off to go on a mission trip, their employer says, please come back. Life is better for them because they are better at life. And it is very exciting to be a student pastor. These students are convinced that life is better following Jesus. Terry Coleman is a college-age student, and he serves on the student dream team. And he gave a message of encouragement at our last Sunday student service. And this is some of what he wrote. I just want to read it to you. It says, my name is Terry Coleman Jr. I want to tell you about the impact this church has had in my life. I have been involved in a small group for seven years. In my small group, I learn about God and his wonders. In my small group, I learned from the Bible. I made decisions to trust God. I made decisions to follow Jesus. Now John McMillan and I lead a student small group with some awesome guys. They're going through stuff I went through a few years ago. I'm able to encourage them. I want these guys to learn from the Bible. I want them to follow Jesus. I want to talk to you about some of the student trips during the summer. Let me tell you, those trips are great. He goes on. I went on a student trip to Garrison's. If you haven't been, you need to go. We have two opportunities to go on a student trip in June. Get signed up before they fill up and it's too late. He says the student trip to Garrison showed me how fun serving and working can be. I have a lot of great memories with great people from Rockbrook. Those trips help me get closer to God. Those trips help me become a better worker. They help me change the direction of my life. 
Terry says, in junior high and high school, the people at Rockbrook worked with me. They encouraged me, they taught me, they provided for me, and now I'm on the student ministry dream team. It feels good to be a part of this team and have a hand in something I grew up in. Going to meetings, planning fun stuff for the students, and just having the opportunity to make a difference in others' lives. He says, I want to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus and knowledge of the Bible. And then he says, I would love if you wore a second Sunday student service t-shirt, if you want to improve your reputation in the community. When you see someone wearing a second Sunday student service shirt, people know that is a hero walking around. When you start seeing these shirts around town, people will know this city is in good hands. <laughs> he says, you are our reputation in the community. You are a witness to the character of Jesus. You are a witness to the quality of Rockbrook. My man, Terry. Isn't that amazing? He is my distraction. Look at what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Your father who sees what is done in, say this out loud, what's done in will reward you. Whatever you do, not for recognition's sake, God says, I'll reward you. I'll promote you. Elisha would tell us that. It says, until I became this guy, I had no idea I would be part of 28 miracles. Twice the amount of Elijah. Only second to Jesus himself in recorded miracles in the Bible. He lived his life with nobody noticing. Elisha would say, give your best in small things, and God will give you bigger things to do. You need to know that God cares about the details. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Elisha would say that. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. I'll follow God. I'll kill my current job. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. Then he went from a prosperous farm to being the servant of Elijah. And one passage says that he poured water on the hands of Elijah. I mean, that, would, that means he did the most menial of tasks. He is washing Elijah's hands. Elisha goes from his wealth to an assistant. Why? Because God cares about the littlest details of your life. For our last Second Sunday student service, we, the theme was, it's a ball. And we had beach balls fall from the ceiling. We threw ping pong balls for the game. We ate meatballs. And uh, we had all kinds of stuff. And we, the handout that we have, uh, we, the student team cut those out in the shape of a ball. So I was having the student team cut those out. And they were teasing me. And they said, if we don't cut these out right, are, are you going to redo these? And Because they know I will. <laughs> I'll redo stuff. Because details matter. God is watching. It's an honor to do this. Why would God give you more responsibility if you can't handle the details? Luke 16.10. Whoever can be trusted with, say it. Very little. Very little. God will trust with a whole lot more. But if you can't be trusted with very little, he's not going to give you a whole lot more. Next one. Give your best in the natural, and God will do the supernatural. Elisha would say, I had no idea that even if I got bold with God and asked him for amazing things, he would do it? Ten years with Elijah, and Elisha has not done a single miracle yet. This is where Elijah is taken to heaven in a chariot. And if you want to read about this, it's in 2 Kings. It says, when they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? God asked the same thing of you. Those of you who feel like your life counts for nothing. What do you want me to do for you? Bless this food, give us a good day. And that's kind of the extent of our prayers. And Elisha would say, go for it. I want a double portion of your spirit. You did 14, I want 28. You have asked a difficult thing. But you know what? God gave it to him. All you have to do is the natural. Ask. Some of you are 
crazy at this. I mean, you are praying for church, you're praying for family, you're praying for healing, you're praying for all kinds of things. And you're like, well, why not ask? I mean, the only thing God can say is no. And why not ask? And you sound like Jesus. Because he said, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. Really? No. They will do even greater things. How in the world is that supposed to happen? Ask me. Why not pray for our kids that way? Why not pray for our jobs that way? Well, what if it doesn't happen? Well, okay, then you're in the same place you were. But what if it does happen? Elisha, 28 recorded miracles, only second to Jesus in the whole Bible. He asked. Elisha would tell you, ask. Don't give up on dreaming. Dream big things for God. So how do you do that? Of the 28 miracles, you're going to love this because this is exactly what I'm talking about with students. Uh, Elisha is a farmer, and he would say, learn how to cultivate the presence of God in your life. Learn to get close to God. I love this. In the history of the nation of Israel, there, there are three kingdoms, Israel, Judah, and Edom. And they come together, and they're going to fight the kingdom of Moab. And everything is going okay until they run out of water. And then the animals are dying, and the people are dying, and they are in trouble. And they are trying to figure out what they're going to do. And one guy pops up, and he says, isn't there anybody in this whole country that hears from God? So, well, there's that Elisha cat. Well, go get him. So they get him. And this is what I'm talking about. Don't let culture mess with you. I know there are a lot of crazy things going on in culture right now. I'm, I'm, I'm totally aware of that as a student pastor. But it's all going to fail. Everything outside of God is going to fail. Then they are going to come back. They're going to come back looking for the people of God. And they'll show up. And when they do show up, don't be ugly about it. Just serve them. Okay, one of our values in student ministry is we don't say... Hey, where have you been? We say, welcome back. Here's what we're doing. That's what Elisha did. What do you need? Okay, you're running out of water. Well, you all need the man of God now, don't you? you know, and he helps out. And they say, we need water. And here's what Elisha says. Bring me a harpist. We need water. Yes. But i got to have some worship music if I'm going to help you out. <laughs> Beat on some trash cans and sing. Let's do this. Elisha, you are a distraction. <laughs> yes. So it says, while the harpist is playing. What were you picturing? <laughs> it says, while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. What is that about? I'll tell you what it's about. Elisha knew that he had no hope for them until he got close to God. He knew he couldn't get close to God until he worshiped. If you want to get close to God, if you get close to God, God will talk to you. When you understand worship, you will hear from God. Elisha is saying, Andrew, God has so much more for you than you realize, but you're only going to find out what it is if you stay close to God. This is true in the New Testament. We have these unschooled, ordinary men. But, while they saw, uh, but when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were nobodies, but look at this, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Listen, small group guys. Do you want to know what sets you apart from everyone else? It's spending time with God. When the world gets in trouble, they're going to look for the people who are close to God. And Elisha would say, stay close to God. Keep the worship music going. Keep talking to God. Ella is a girl in our student ministry, eighth grade. And I want to read her testimony that she shared at the student service. It says, hi, my name is Ella. This is the story of what God has been teaching me lately. Recently, I have been going to small group and the student services. 
I've also gone through the growth track classes and been helping out with kids' small groups. It makes me happy to be able to show other people what I have learned. My time with God has been really good lately. I pray a lot more than I used to. I am also learning more about God's word than I knew before. My small group and the people around me are always encouraging me. I've enjoyed getting to see my friend Atlantis from the small group at school during the week. We encourage each other to work hard and do our best. This has helped me to get stuff done and feel better about myself. It's also made me want to help others more. I am happy every day knowing that there are people watching out for me. My friends and family care about what happens to me. I don't always like sharing my feelings or what's wrong in my life, but I'm able to talk about it with my small group. I would love it if you'd pray that I grow in my faith. Put God's word to work in my life. Be ready to help others. Continue to enjoy my small group. Always have a smile and have lots of fun. Let me tell you, as a student pastor, I want to thank you. Thank you. You are a big part of these stories. You're a huge part of it. You invest in our student ministry. And those who do the work and those who sow in the work, the Bible says that they are glad together. You have a reward in these students. And I think Ella gets it. She says, pray for me that I would grow in my faith, put God's word to work in my life, continue in my small group, and have a positive attitude. And that's what Elisha would say. At some point, you have to wake up and do something. Some of you have big dreams, and you're waiting around for God, and God is waiting around for you. What am I supposed to do? Anything! Anything! The Bible says whatever you do, do it with all your might. Go find something to do. How do we have so many students involved in ministries at Rockbrook? They're doing something. Students greeting, holding babies, working with children, leading small groups, taking out the trash, making sure you have cups for your coffee. You ask any of our students who are, who are on a dream team, and they will tell you, my Christian life came alive when I went from coming to church to serving at church. It changed everything. That's what Elisha would say. After the harpist came and he knew what they were supposed to do, he said, this is what the Lord says. Go dig some ditches. Get a shovel and start digging but there wasn't even a sign of a cloud in the sky. There are so many people here that are excited about their faith and life. There are some people who feel stuck. You need to dig some ditches. You just need to do something. Because faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by, say it out loud, action is a dead faith. Somebody's like, my Christian faith is pretty dead right now. That's why. Just start digging. But there's no cloud in the sky. It doesn't matter. Make room for it. Last thing. In student ministry, I don't give the last thing until the end because as soon as that blank is filled, they're done. But they will sit there till Jesus comes back if that blank is empty. So I'm doing the same thing to you. Here's the verse. For this is what the Lord says. You will see neither wind nor rain. You're not going to see anything. Yet this valley is going to be filled with water. And you, your cattle, and your other animals will drink. It's an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. I can make it rain without a cloud in the sky. Why is that so important? It's because I get discouraged when I don't see signs. Just because I don't see anything doesn't mean that God isn't working. When what we see doesn't match up with what God spoke, that is when we walk by faith and not by sight. That's what Elisha would say before he headed back up. He'd say, keep digging. Hang in there. Maybe you are a distraction. Maybe you are teaching a distraction. Maybe you work with a distraction. Maybe you're raising a distraction. I am so thankful for parents for a a church, youth pastor, teachers who challenged me, said, Andrew, people follow you. You better be worth following. And here's how. Look, you got to be careful about getting discouraged. When what you see doesn't match up with what God spoke to you, don't base your life on the seen, but the unseen. 
We walk by faith and not by sight. And all the parents said big, amen. Would you bow your heads right where you are? Put your stuff quietly in your lap. Because no moving around. God is dealing with people right now. For those of you who serve on one of our teams, for those of you who give, for those of you who show up early and stay late, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are part of every story. If you're glad that you go to church here and you're not involved yet, we need you. I'm excited you're here. You have an opportunity to get involved and make a difference like you never have before. God, I pray that these people would never buy into the lie that they are a nobody. God, for every person who came in discouraged because they feel underappreciated, unnoticed, I pray that you would stir something in them right now, right where they are. That as we get close to you, as we walk not by what our eye sees, but what our heart sees, help us be worth following. Not for our glory, but for yours alone.